You know what I love about Halloween, Elliot? What's that? The poultry guys are here. Actually, sorry, I cut you off too soon. No, it's too fine. excited. No, it was good. I hated it, but it was good. God, it was so bad. I'm pretty proud of it. If we're, you know, being honest here. Okay, so for the people who haven't been scared off yet, welcome to another By episode. By my scary jokes. Yeah, they're terrible. Welcome to another episode of the Poor Pearls Almanac. It's usually not this bad, or it's the norm. It's kind of sort of hit or miss. That's a hell of a tagline. It's usually not this bad. You set them up, I knock them down with those razor sharp puns. What are we talking about today? And I swear to God, if it's chickens, I'm not. Not like, chickens. We're actually going to continue our tour of Asia, as we've been doing, to talk about some uh, ancient Indian farming practices that have been gaining some momentum over the past decade through some, uh, what you could call, I guess, new iterations. There are some issues with these new iterations. We don't really have the time or bandwidth to talk about those right now because, you know, we do have a lot of content that we do want to cover in this entire podcast. We can't get too sidetracked. And, you know, I think people would rather learn how to grow a tomato before the last satellite falls out of the black sky. Has the first satellite fallen out of the sky? Why is that your question of all questions to ask out of all of everything that he just said? Well, okay, well, I bought my tomato seeds and just, when do I got to plant them out? I got to know. All right, so we are going to be talking about something very important for tomato seeds, okay? It's actually one of the oldest applied sciences in ancient India. It's called Vrikshayurveda, which means quite literally plant life science. It's not quite like botany or medicine, but it really just covers like a wide breadth of specialties. Now, with these ancient Indian sciences, they're not traditionally compartmentalized like how we think of Western disciplines, you know, where everything kind of silos, right? Instead, there's a lot of recognition of these overlaps. So like... Despite talking about plant life science, mathematics is a huge component of these practices. So compared to some of the other stuff we've talked about, how ancient is this? So most of the Pearl Model series that we've done have been really focused from like 4000 BC to around 1000 AD. This is at that newer stage of that space, right? So we're talking around 700 BCE. And this is where Ayurveda was basically at least conclusively documented. Now, this science originally started with health management, and this was soon applied to domesticated animals and garden plants and things like that. And it was also inclusive of things like perennials, uh, so you're like shrubs and trees as well. Okay, so this sort of is throwing me back to our episode about the Western cats. I'm sure they weren't the only folks doing forest farming in the area, right? Also, someone calculate that into bears entering for me because we're some, some sorts of mathematicians as well. And uh, we came up with, uh, what was it, a me unit of measure uh, with bears and time, I believe. Yeah, I think it was before bears or after bears, right? When the bears showed up in Ireland. Yes, before bears entering. Yes, BE. Yeah, so I think we're in like 2000 BE. Oh, wait, that doesn't make sense. This is probably... Uh, it never did. The, no, it didn't. But I, I want to say probably 3500 years BE. So after, or after bears entering, I don't know. The Abe system is just totally flawed. Don't use it. Uh, <laughs> so, well, we we gotta try where we can. You know, we gotta yeah, push well, these. We gotta go back to shacks. Shacks work yeah, great. Shack lens. Yeah, shack. No questions asked. So, uh, what we're talking about are ancient and medieval agricultural texts, right? And what they basically describe is what we now call, you know, organic farming. And in this process, described not just the nutritional piece, but complete operations required for production of basically all kinds of crops, everything from grains to sugars to fruits and vegetables and others. The primary text, Rig Veda, includes references to agriculture and animal husbandry in particular. Now, Sanskrit texts on farming of crops and animal management were also called uh, Krishi Sutkis. The first well-known text on Krishi Sutki was Krishi Parashara around 400 BC. I know I'm throwing a bunch of new words at you. They're really not super important for the purpose of this episode, just trying to frame some of this up. More of these texts were written in later centuries, and they're continuing, or at least in recent memory, have been unearthed. For example, Krishi Parashara uh, is probably the first ever quote-unquote textbook on agriculture in which information is logically organized into what we think of today as, like, chapters. That's kind of interesting that, like, they did put it into... 
this sort of like textbook that they like had the or like they wrote it down because i feel like a lot of the other pro model series that we've done the biggest challenge to like preserving the farming practices is that they were so well understood at the time it would be like now writing a book on how to be a white guy starting a podcast yeah i mean it's in our blood yeah and i'd also guess that the relationship between science and spirituality are so connected it's basically like a religious text but for plant and animal relationships and how to build those bonds and keep them strong because those are your life force to where you live yeah and i think that makes a lot of sense given the the religious components of those re that region right where um the those life ways are so integrated into the food systems and that's kind of been personified in those religious practices yeah or sort of like older white dudes needing to tell everyone their opinion spiritually connected exactly now krishi parashara for example is unique in that it is not only about the the plants but also goes into detail on things like the parts of a plow paying attention to time and seasons general agronomic practices and management things very similar to like what we think of today as like agronomy right cattle sanitation health nutrition seed health prediction of seasonal rainfall based on astrological models that are followed by thousands of farmers even today so like think of the almanac not the poor proles almanac but the other one right the manures used were the stored cow dung primarily as well as the other farm animals and then small balls of the manure were placed in seed sowing trenches now there's a bunch of different reference books and i won't pretend to be an expert in understanding how these things relate to one another but each book refers to specific types of practices and not necessarily stuff that's just about the actual farming which to elliot's point paints that it was more than just like the farming itself hell yeah points for me so one text, its name is not super important, and I can't pronounce it anyway, and I won't embarrass myself or insult an entire region. And basically what it does is cover practices followed in growing irrigated rice, but also advises rulers to provide strong support to farmers and their activities, as well as things like management of water reservoirs, and even stresses the need for participation of people of all castes in farm-related activities. Checkmate, rich assholes. And I do not think this is why Bill is buying all of the farmland. Yeah, it's highly doubtful. So my point is that they used the power of needing food to help dictate and manage some of the worst, you know, most pernicious aspects of what it means to be human by pairing these things together, by taking our natural tendencies, and I use that word natural tendencies pretty loosely, to do bad things, to hold you know, the, the rich or the powerful a little bit more in check, right? By pairing it with this agricultural content. And like I said, there are a bunch of different books on different practices, which if you're familiar with India, it makes a lot of sense because there's a lot of different languages and religions. And uh, it, it probably took a real long time for all these books to get compiled. Now, typically these books will be called the Vrikshire Veda and then the name of the person who compiled it. These books are difficult to work with from a Western perspective because of the fact they are often more descriptive as opposed to, say, prescriptive. It's never about how to necessarily fix a problem, but instead explaining how things should be done as a way to say, are you deviating from this? And if you are, then you have to figure out how to get back to where you should be, right? Now, these methods and processes for things like soil replenishment are given by, again, utilizing cow dung, farmyard manure, practices like compost making, mulching shade nets, greenhouse-like structures, water body management, even things to the point of drip irrigation, utilization of silt, and a ton more, which I know is like, it seems like very advanced compared to what you might think of when we're talking about ancient texts, right? Now, for example, when uh, describing lands and the needs of irrigation, the goal is never to make all the land as similar as possible, like a perfect soil, like we often hear about with traditional agriculture, right? But utilizing each for what it offers through the uniqueness of the land itself. Lands are recognized as being unsuitable for plants for human resources, and that's frankly okay. Texts are often also specified for specific regions and tackling the challenges of those specific biomes. Now, the most significant innovation, probably the first in world agri-history, at least from what I can find in terms of like documentation, 
was the development of fermented liquid manures from organic waste. Like, for example, what's called kuna pajala, which literally means filthy liquid, or kuna pambu, which means fermented filth. Now, kuna pajala, which we'll be talking about a bit, is uh, used primarily for seed dressing, soil drench, or for like sprinkling on top of plants. Okay, so that last part goes along the lines of like KNF, but this is like a thousand years before, right? And it was Master Cho that came up with our sort of, you know, brought the word back with KNF after the Korean War. So I'm guessing this is probably part of where some of his ideas came from, except, you know, took a little bit of time to marinate and get right. Oh, he's got to marinate, right? So I, I don't think I've ever seen any explicit evidence of it, but the idea of fermentation has, you know, just generally speaking, had a really long history in this part of the world, right? So I wouldn't be surprised if he was at least familiar with the process. I mean, I'd imagine that a lot of these things were continuing to be used in more rural areas, right? Where they didn't have access to a lot of traditional fertilizers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it also like, there are like similarities to what we've talked about with Jadam. And I'm sure it was like also an influence on Jadam. Yeah. And although I said I, we wouldn't really talk about it, zero budget natural farming is, you know, what stems from this practice and basically takes Jadam and these practices and smashes them together with like a bunch of pseudoscience garbage that kind of just basically is because i think the founder wants to be like a cult leader yeah bro just start a podcast and you can be a cult leader this shit ain't hard you know what you really need to have though to be a successful cult commercials control of good drugs and bad drugs oh yeah i was gonna say commercials too sorry no drugs is probably a better answer first off and i mean this from the bottom of my heart those are both terrible terrible answers the answer Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Let's learn more about Reagan in the following ad break. Do you like having a garden? Yeah. Do you not like getting dirty? Yeah. Great. Neither do we. Introducing Do Nothing Landscaping. This sounds like just what I'm looking for. Can you take care of my pesky lawn? Of course. Our lawn care package includes not mowing your lawn and not pulling weeds. Do you seed and fertilize too? Nope. Spray Roundup? Absolutely not. So what do you do? Fuck all. We do absolutely nothing. Wow, I'm convinced. How do I get started? Pay us a $50 monthly subscription fee and we'll not mow your lawn, we'll not rake up leaves, and if you sign up today, you'll be enrolled in our super VIP privacy program. That means you'll never fucking see us ever again. So stop doing something and start doing nothing today. Welcome back to our good friends who are likely just returning from donating to the Coke Foundation. If you still need it, their own mo handle is Tiny Dex, all one word, capital T, capital D, no spaces. Good people doing good things for the earth. You know, if you think Raytheon is good for plants, and you know, we know they are. Let me tell you my disappointment when I found out who the Coke brothers actually were. Oh yeah, no, they're like coke from coal. Way worse people. Speaking of cooking stuff from the bowels of the earth, let's talk about animal waste. God, what a shitty transition. Get it, you guys? Got Sh it. Shitty? G yep, shitty. So, Surapala's procedure for Vrikshayurveda of Surapala, like I said, usually was the name smashed with Vrikshayurveda, was for treating the soil, involves collecting and storing animal waste as and when available. Although waste from dead boar were specifically mentioned first, Surapala expanded the source of waste to other animals, especially those with horns. There's a bone joke in there somewhere. The wastes are cooked and then stored after mixing uh, with husk. I'm sorry, cooked? Even if I could get literal bullshit, I'm not cooking it. Cook up some poop, then make some lunch, you know? Poop and soup. Stool and gruel. Classics. I hate all of those ideas, and this is all your fault. Now, after it was cooled, the farmer would traditionally add sesame oil cake, honey, soaked black graham, and finally the ghee. All right, this just seems like a waste of a lot of good calories. It was suggested to store animal waste underground, possibly to contain the foul order. Don't know what they're talking about. As well as to protect materials from scavengers. This is also similar to the traditional anaerobic practices that we saw to ferment bokashi, right? Now, Surapala has also mentioned that waste from other animals such as like cow, porpoise, cat, deer, elephant, and so on can also be used. Okay, so to answer the question no one was asking of what to do with your cat shit as a prepper, here you go. 
Welcome to the Paul Pearl's Almanac, where we answer questions no one has ever asked or would even think to ask. For science. For science. It's why we do this, really. The love of you the know, game. The love of the game. <laughs> now, now we talked about Kuna Pajala, right? Now, with the application of this filthy liquid that we talked about earlier, is very different than like traditional uh, organic manures. Very different than the fermented filth? Exactly. I mean, how could you ever get fermented filth and filthy liquid confused? You know, I'd, I'd be embarrassed to confuse them, to be honest. That's like... You should. That's a serious... Yeah. It's pathetic. Weak. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll leave the Zoom. <laughs> so, Kuna Pajala is a liquid. Like everything we've been talking about, the ingredients of Kuna Pajala have been fermented, which means the proteins and fats are already broken down into simple, low molecular weight products and more available to plants uh, faster than from like traditionally applied organic matter, right? If you put a compost down, it's going to take more time than to be able to use this fermented product. Now, in the modern era, it's been primarily used as a spray or a soil, like something to soak your soil with. And that, that spray process of diluted Kuna Pajala is a pretty modern innovation. Okay, so this is like the original compost tea. That kind of makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you could call it that. Now, the thing is, like I said earlier, there were a bunch of books, and many of them were basically lost or forgotten until fairly recently. So in terms of like mainstream use, the traditional practice has been basically lost for like a thousand years, or at least a couple hundred years, although variants continue to exist. And chances are, you know, like everything we talk about in the show, uh, there probably are farmers that have been continuously working with and even improving some of these practices, right? In most cases, we think these things are like always lost, but they they just tend to continue on the margins of communities to exist unabated, and like that's what keeps these things alive. Now, the first person who experimented in any public sense with uh, Kuna Pajala was Valmiki Srinivasa Iyengarya, a mathematician by training who renounced materialistic life about 20 years ago. Valmiki reported excellent results when Kuna Pajala was applied to mango and coconut and continued to test out variations of Kuna Pajala using vegetable waste, and then he fermented those in human urine. He again observed really great effects on the growth of several fruit and vegetable plants. I knew math was a gateway drug. That's why I failed out of math school. I was too straight edge for that shit. It's true, he had a fairly straight edge in high school. So our boy Val prepared Kuna Pajala by fermenting aerobically safari fish, which is mentioned in Virkshire Veda, and he fermented that fish in cow urine and sprayed tea bushes at 1% concentration of the ferment, which he named in safari. Valmiki found in safari to be both an insecticide and growth promoter. In addition, Valmiki prepared Kuna Pajala from poultry, specifically chicken, and called it Kakuda kunapa. It used it very effectively in increasing kiwi fruit yields from 200 pounds to over 3,500 pounds in the course of a year. All right. So I know we've said it before, and those numbers are just absolutely ridiculous, but this does sound a lot like KNF. Can you imagine being like, I killed this chicken and the five pound chicken has changed my yield on my kiwi fruit to 3,000 pounds more? Like, talk about a turnaround on $4 or four pounds worth of protein. Yeah, we have like chickens here and they, some of them die and we just like bury them in the compost pile. But to like using that to, what's that? That's a 3,300 pound gain in your yields. Sounds like bullshit. I mean, it could be, we don't know. It's possible he totally overinflated that number, but I don't doubt that it probably did something good. But the point of bringing all this up, and we haven't really gotten into like the gritty details of what people can actually take into what they're doing at their own backyard right now that are listening to this, uh, is that I think this is kind of like a really good framework for like a missing link for a lot of natural farming practices, right? We're seeing all these things come back, you know, KNF, Jadam, Bukashi is making, you know, coming around. We're seeing a lot of these ideas of how do we create compost teas? And all of this comes back to these traditional practices. And this is like one of the oldest documented sources that we have that probably outlines a lot of these different things, right? So it's really important to at least understand it through a direct source, right? Through a first source, uh, our primary source. Again, we've talked about 
Bokashi, we've talked about Jadam, we've talked about Korean natural farming. And it's really interesting, these all came from the same part of the world, as well as something as simple as natural farming from Fukuoka. So I wonder how much of its success was because of also like maybe better attention being paid to these plants. And I think that's something like simple that gets like kind of overlooked in a lot of the ways we like talk about at least like traditional agriculture here. And just like being aware of it means that you're going to like catch small stuff before it becomes a big problem. Yeah, absolutely. Like I think that's something we see with regenerative agriculture, right? A lot of people are like, my pasture looks like shit and I'm going to try regenerative agriculture. And it's like, is that the thing that's making it better? Like the transition practices of moving your cattle or whatever you're grazing, or is it just that you're paying more attention in general and you expect it to change? So you're paying more attention to see if it's changing and you're catching shit all of a sudden, right? Now, to get back to what we're trying to talk about, though, despite these recipes that we just brought up being you know, unique that Valmiki created, similar guidance for these types of recipes can still be found in these old texts to control things like insects, right? So, for example, things like powders of specific barks are soaked overnight in cow urine and then uh, in some cases are just pasted right on the affected parts. So basically, like Judaeum, specific plants have specific traits and benefits, but instead of fermenting it in a bucket of water with leaf litter, we're using more like manure and urine as the like base materials. And listen, if I'm being honest, I'm not digging holes every day to shit. Of all the things in collapse, that's the one I'm looking forward to the least, I think. So let's put the waste to work. Close the loop. Talking about that poop loop. Poop loop. Poop loop. Maybe we can get that trending. Hashtag close the poop loop. No, I don't want that to be our first trending chat hashtag ever. Is it just poop loop? Poop loop? No. That'd be better. Didn't wait. Is it didn't hyper hyperloop? The hyperloop? Hyper poop loop? You know, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think we've said the word poop way too many times in this episode. Even for me. Don't love it. Not yet. Anyways. Anyone that's ever tried making a traditional food from like an old cookbook, one of the really fun things about these old cookbooks, concept of like measurement didn't exist. It would say like, how much salt? Some. How hot? Pretty hot. How long? Till it's done. Like, thanks. Thanks for those answers. And these are the same types of answers you get in the Frickshire Veda as well. Now, that's not awful when you've grown up around it, so you know the process, but that needs guidance to tackle those specific problems, right? If you're going to be using it, you need to have some kind of framework to make sure you don't screw it up. Not great when you're trying to revive like thousand year old practice. Yeah. And if I'm cooking poop, I'm not going to get it wrong. Right. I'm going to try to get it right. Oh, that sounds so awful. There's a big difference between incorrectly cooking asparagus and cooking shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's fair. For the rest of the episode, we're going to really focus on the practices of fermentation, specifically in these texts, because we're most interested in soil mending here. But I do just want to point out this is a very, very small part of Rikshar Veda, and we could honestly do an entire season dedicated to the different things covered in literally thousands of pages of dense content that these books cover. Now, part of the reason I didn't want to is because of the fact that a lot of it is very specific to India, which I know, surprise isn't where a lot of our listeners are based out of, and also because we only have so much time. Uh, But also, because we do get a lot of messages about the use of human ore, or people that are interested in, like people interested in just general sustainability around compost, toilets, and so on, as well as people that are really into like utilizing animals for, you know, tools to replace tractors and things like that. And obviously that comes with all of these other issues of having a lot of cattle manure sitting around, right? So how do we utilize that in a way that uh, is really effective? And how do we kind of tackle some of these issues that people might be, you know, not thinking about today, but might be thinking about in the future, right? Uh, And this is just in general, not an area I've ever really heard get covered in like the permaculture like area. Um, I I don't know how we kind of fit into that, but I guess we're kind of in that umbrella. Gross. Did you just call us permies? I don't know, like alts agriculture. I don't know. It's it's an umbrella term people are like, I guess could kind of put us in like something that's not just like CAFOs and traditional agriculture. I don't know. 
Uh, not important, I guess. Basically, what you're saying is it's time for us to run a commercial about the upcoming Poor Pearls PDC. For the low price of $4,000, you can come provide free labor on Andy's farm using the guise of learning. Swales. Full disclosure, that's not a thing. But these commercials absolutely probably are things. Thanks for tuning in to the Poor Pearls Almanac. We've been exploring new areas of content, including new podcasts such as Tomorrow Today and the Gastropocene with yours truly, but also building a network with folks like Death and Friends. We're also building gardening resources and have a bunch of other content coming in the future. If you'd like to get more information or to sign up for our newsletter where we announce new projects, head over to poorproles.com and click on the Our Email List tab. The email list is only used for important newsworthy content and we won't clog your inbox and you'll get less than six emails a year. That's poorproles.com at the Our Email List tab. And we're back. And with all the registrations for our upcoming class, I can finally afford to build all those things you're going to come build for me. So thank you. This is a joke. There's no Proles PDC. Yet. You're playing the long game. You gotta lure them in with the free podcast content and set a hook at $500 a month on exclusive access to giving them free labor. And it was Andy that whispered in my ear, you can't spell agriculture without cult. <sighs> is this what it feels like for you guys when I make dad jokes? Because this is just, this is just terrible. I hope so. I don't, I don't, I don't think Andy like can experience that sort of pain. It's a, like, it's a unique pain. Good, good. It makes me feel better. Speaking of unique pain, let's dive into the meat and the poop potatoes on this. Oh, God, you've learned nothing. Never. So we've chatted a bit about Kuna Pajala at this point, right? And like I said, we don't have specific information about how to make it traditionally. But research has been going on to uh, recreate these methods. And I'm going to give an example of one recipe that was tested and showed like significant improved crop performance. Now, I'm going to make this as simple as possible just because this is an audio format and we'll probably at some point put this up someplace we we haven't figured out how to really organize some of the stuff yet but we're getting there but it's basically two and a half parts fish devoid of scales don't know what's in the scales but they don't want them so two and a half parts fish one part powdered sesame oil cake rice husk and molasses so one part for all those and eight parts cow urine by weight basically what you do is boil the fish cool and mix these in the pot, close the lid, allow to ferment, and stir it twice a day. If you're looking for more specific instructions, good luck. I saw at least like four totally different recipes for Kuna Pajala, but this one in particular had studies tied to it, so that's why I went with that. Now, the other added benefit was that of the recipes, this one had the most ingredients that we could come up with here in the U.S. Sesame oil cake and rice husk would probably be the hardest, but if you grow like sunflowers and press the sunflower seeds for oil i'm sure the cake from the sunflower would be fine rice husk i imagine would be something that you could substitute like another fibrous waste product so like if you milled grains or something like that yeah there's definitely options yeah and i think i know where we could find some urine piss jug time piss jug time hell yeah get those piss jugs those juggy boys (laughs) now (laughs) god damn it (laughs) (laughs) Now, um, multiple researchers did extensive testing of the Kuna Pajala's macro and micro content as it fermented, and this was actually really interesting. What really matters is that depending on what you want to get out of it was severely impacted by when you wanted to use it. So, for example, nitrogen doubled from day 0 to 20, but by day 40, it had cut back in half. Phosphorus, on the other hand increased a little bit to day 20 and then doubled by day 40. Potassium doubled at day 20, but by day 40 had increased only a little bit more. So you'd probably want to use like the day 20 fermentation in crops and their like vegetative growth stage and then the like day 40 mixture on plants when they're like closer to flowering. Is that how that would like line up? Yeah, I think so. So you could use the same Kuna Pajal on the same plant later in the year for different reasons, which is like pretty cool, right? Now, what was also interesting is that fungal growth also continued to grow the longer it fermented as well, suggesting it might also make more sense to apply older batches to things that need a higher fungal ratio, so like tree crops, right? Some folks also suggested fermenting for 60 days or even longer as well. 
Okay, so I, I bet that smelled great, and you probably had to like live upwind of that, right? Yeah, I mean, it literally translates to the smell of death. So yeah, maybe don't do this one in the house. Now, they didn't have any studies for that 60-day or anything longer. Clearly, some research needs to be done, so if somebody wants to write some grants, that could be a great opportunity to just ferment some fish. Studies have shown that not only is it effective as a fertilizer compared to simple manure, in one study, it actually beat inorganic fertilizers, like the chemical stuff, with plants showing 10% height improvements to traditional fertilizers, 10% increased total leaf area to traditional fertilizers, and 15% increases in root length. Again, this is in comparison to conventional fertilizers, like the stuff that we spend millions and billions of dollars producing. When paired with panchagavia, which we haven't talked about, tomatoes actually grew 51.3% larger than the control and created 106% more total biomass. Holy shit. I mean, kind of literally. Yeah, holy shit, kind of literally. Now, a variant of this, and by variant, I mean it overlaps with other recipes of kunapajala, is shisya gavya. And this is a fermented mixture of cow dung, cow urine, vegetable waste, and water. And that's in a one to one to one to two ratio. So the only thing that's two in that ratio is the water. Everything else is one. And it's generally prepared by chopping and fermenting weeds and water along with cow dung and urine. Now, these are strained and then sprayed or treated like a drench, just like we talked about in KNF Forge Dam, at a 10 to 1 ratio with water, so about 1.5 cups per gallon, sprayed weekly. In side by side testing, Kuna Pajala usually seemed to do better, but Shasya Gavya had higher growth rates, primarily with Forbes, although. That's just anecdotal evidence from different studies that I kind of took out of it, not something anyone went out to actually try and prove. Okay, so let me clarify this for myself, because you've thrown a couple of recipes at us. So we've got kuna pajala, which is fermented fish, and piss with some starchy plants, which we use for like earlier, younger plants, we use that earlier on and help them grow. And then we strain it off and use it later on after it's sat for a little bit for bigger plants. Then we've got Shasia gavia, which is also piss, shit, and vegetable waste, which is good for bigger plants. And then we've got Pancha gavia. Like, how, wh what is that? Which we haven't covered yet. Yeah. We haven't covered Pancha gavia yet, even though oh. I've talked about it a ton. Okay. Well, I guess to ask the question that no one has asked since that's my job whose piss and shit are we using this time? Huh, Andy? We'll get there. Are you using mine? Is that what I've been shitting in a bucket for you for? That you'd never explain to me? It's like, this is your poo bucket now. <laughs> that was not part of the job when we asked Matt to come on to this project. Andy is actually locked in his basement <laughs> panic room. Just podcasting. With just yeah. a uh, bucket in the corner. And access to the internet, but only Instagram to make memes. That's yeah. it. That's all I got. Yeah. Can't If I type anything that suggests what's happening, I'm blacklisted. It's all over. Speaking of, is your like exercise wheel getting squeaky? Do we need to WD-40 that, or is it good for another couple weeks? No, nah, I fermented something, and it just lubed it right up. Oh, it's God. Fine. Oh, yeah. that is dark. That is dark, boys. <laughs> yeah. And he hasn't seen the sunlight in three years. He has giant black eyes and really pale skin. Happens to the best of for us. For our listeners, because this is an audio format. Yeah, they can't see this. That's why we don't do video. Yeah. <laughs> no. All right. So uh, I'll talk about what Elliot's curious about. Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so Pancha Gavio, we haven't covered. We're going to. And like I mentioned with Kuna Pajala, there's like extreme variety. The example that we gave was about fermented fish, but there are ones with milk and ghee and cow dung, and it all falls under that Kuna Pajala category, which seems insane, right? But the constant is that there is fermented fish with urine, all the other stuff, the cow dung, the ghee, whatever else they put in it, it seems to be fairly interchangeable. And that's probably based on like location or like where those recipes came from, which again, to the point I made, makes me feel pretty okay with like swapping out different, you know, plant cake material and starches. And the human piss, which you brought into this, the piss drugs. Can't forget the piss drugs. God, did Trump write these farming practices? I got one for you, Andy. The art of breaking the seal. If you guys could just see the look on Elliot's face as he made that joke. Anyways, the one dude who was doing research on new methods decided to use rats instead of fish. So, you know, it's it's a pretty wide window of what you can do with it. 
I mean, you can get the locally sourced, though, but organic, free range, local rats. Yeah, I'm. I'm pretty confident that was kind of what what drove that, right? So let's talk about Panchagavia because Elliot's just super excited about this. So first, it's considered a biodigested manure, which is a fancy way of saying microbes are fermenting it. There's a few of these, Panchagavia being the most common. There's also Jivamrutha and Bijamrutha, to name the top three, we'll call it. I'm only bringing up Panchagavia because it's the most common, and it would be odd to keep it out. But the recipe isn't designed for the average farmer here in the United States. It's made of cow dung, cow urine, milk, curd, jaggery, which is just super unprocessed sugar, basically, ghee, banana, tender coconut water, and regular water. Okay, I know we live in the Northeast, but I don't think we get locally sourced coconut in most places in the country. Yeah, exactly. So I've mentioned it now, and I'm going to talk about uh, Jiva Mrutha because it, it's going to sound pretty familiar. It's basically JLF, but slightly different. You get a big 55-gallon barrel like we do with JLF. You add 11 pounds of cow dung, a handful of soil from your farm, three gallons of cow urine, two pounds of brown sugar, two pounds of bean flour, and you stir that three times a day for 10 minutes for four days. Keep it in the shade in a breathable lid. It's ready after four days and is only good for a few days after, and it's used at a 10 to 1 ratio. Again, Sounds pretty on brand for Jadam treatments. Yeah, the biggest thing is really the bean flour, which I mean, you can go buy a bag of black beans and just grind it up, right? And like KNF and Jadam, Vrikshayurveda has exploded in this process of creating these different things into a number of different areas from the fertilization we've been talking about to pest repellent to seed treatments, uh, all, again, uh, in early stages of being tested through the traditional western scientific institution model right i think a, a big part of the reason we don't hear much about them is that most of the folks in the u.s just generally don't have like a lot of cow shit sitting around but yeah but jesus christ you got me thinking about fermenting all this pig shit we have here yeah and that's the thing the the formulas are really loose around these based on the research i've seen and of course we're just really you know very very much scratching the surface on the subject we're we're almost like not even scratching the surface. We're so topical at this point. We didn't talk about Amrut Jal, which is a pest repellent, or any of the other biodigesters. We didn't get into zero-budget natural farming other than criticizing the guy that started it. And uh, maybe one day we'll do an episode just on him. We are absolutely doing an episode on that. I will add it to the real list. To the real list? Yeah. The, la the last thing I did want to... Elliot, don't you shake your head at me. Well, see, we got, we got two lists for Andy. We got the real one that's interesting stuff we want to cover, and then there's Andy's list. Wow. I do not know about this other list, first off. Well, we don't write uh, down yours. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's very sweet of you. So the last thing I did want to add to this conversation is that um, there was some testing of these methods uh, separately, but one particular study put Panchagavya and Kuna Pajala together and they were found to be best uh, in better utilization of leaf nitrogen, efficient photosynthetic activity, and improving yields. So, like, we're seeing that pairing them creates better results than these things separately. And that, that's awesome. So, like, we're really only, like I said, and I'm going to say it again, scratching the surface of this subject. And not even just in terms of the research, but even just, like, figuring this out in the field before academics get their hands on it. But, you know, I, I think it's really cool and uh, I guess you could say like hopeful. And I think a lot of it will be particularly useful around the field of like human manure for most people or human manure for most people, uh, which we did touch on like super, super briefly today, but is probably something we will add to the list to cover on its own someday. Right, Matt? That's right. Yeah, shitting is not a team sport and it doesn't get shared with other content. You know what? That's a great place to end. Shitting is not a team sport. <sighs> well, there goes my my new uniform. Sorry, two girls. More like sorry, one cup. All right, we just. All right, goodbye, listeners. Bye.